Hi everyone! Welcome back to another episode of Apply Club Events, hosted by IASA's Applied Anthropology Network. Today, we had the pleasure of listening to Walter Feisch, the founder of Green Culture Lab and the co-author of Anthropologist Wanted, with the topic, Anthropology rocks, but if we confuse, we lose. We hope you're going to enjoy this episode, and please don't forget to follow us on our diverse channels like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Slack, and more, which you can find in the show notes. Walter, I'm sure, does not need uh, much introduction. Um, he's a well-known and beloved colleague, um, a true anthro rock star, uh, I would say. Uh, he's an organizational anthropologist working on corporate culture and sustainability. Um, he's the founder of Green Culture Lab, a consultancy which helps organizations and multi multinationals put sustainability at the heart of their operations. Uh, he advises on a broad range of corporate topics such as change management, stakeholder engagement, and cultural change. Uh, Walter holds a master's degree in anthropology from Utrecht University and has in turn also given numerous talks, masterclasses, and workshops um, with clients from a broad range of backgrounds, from city municipalities, universities, and consulting firms to social enterprises, healthcare institutions, and housing corporations. He is the co editor of the newly released in English Anthropologists Wanted Why Organizations Need Anthropologists together with Lorenz Bakker and Marsha Cohen, a highly anticipated collection with advice for those interested to break in an organizational anthropology. And he will speak with us today on how we should not confuse or else we lose as anthropologists. And so, Walter, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, for, <laughs> for this introduction. And um, I hope I can live up to the dream of being an, an intro rock star as you announced me. Um, those are <laughs> big shoes to fill. So I hope I, uh, I kind of make it true and, and, and not disappoint you. I prepared a small presentation for you I'll share later on, but first I will just talk a little bit about who I am and, and, and how I got to be where I am um, because Laura already introduced me, but she doesn't know everything about me yet. <laughs> um, so I'm, uh, I'm Walter Fai. Um, I live in uh, Utrecht, which is one of the four uh, major cities here uh, and still very, uh, well, kind of small. It's about 300,000 people living here. Um, I became a father about one year ago and it impacted my life in many ways. Uh, I couldn't expect, but, but nicely and intense at the same time. So I'm still, uh, f well, finding out myself again and again. <laughs> um, and thank you for con congratulating me. Um, and I'm telling you this because I think um, anthropology is, is a, a science about uh, humans and about meaning. Um, so we are more than just professionals uh, uh, inside a function, inside an organization. So we are humans. And, and besides having that professional role, we are a lot more than that. So I always, um, when I start a meeting or a session like this, I always uh, try to check in with other people, not on the professional level, but also on the personal level. So that's why I, I'm telling you this. Um, and my anthropological journey um, took a turn in 2010 because then I, um, I was graduating and I did my uh, master's research on Greenland because um, my topic was climate change. And I thought, where in the world could you see climate change uh, in a better way than on Greenland, which seems to be uh, melting or struggling to, to find its way through climate change. So I went there. And as an anthropologist, I was fascinated by what I found as a researcher, as a scientist, as an anthropologist. But as a, as a, as a person, as a human being, I was shocked by what I found, by the, the grief and the tears and the frustration and, um, and, 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 and the anger uh, of the people living there who's, who were experiencing their lives, well, literally or metaphorically melting away. <laughs> Um, because climate change was severely impacting their um, their economy, but also their um, societal systems. So I came back to Holland uh, in 2010, but um, in Europe, a financial crisis uh, was was well at its height or depth, depending on <laughs> your take on it. Um, and I was an anthropologist, wanted to work in the field of sustainability, so I didn't give myself the easiest cards to 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 <laughs> find a pathway. Um, but I started a company 
2011, May 2011. So actually, I had my 10 year anniversary uh, about two months ago. So those 10 years, they flew by. Um, but I um, actually, I enjoy being an entrepreneur, running a company and doing the work I do more and more every year. Um, so this is this is who I am, where I come from a little bit. And, and because I had quite a hard time finding my way as an anthropologist on in, in the labor market, but also finding my voice in terms of climate change and sustainability in my role. And I really believed uh, there was a role for anthropologists in general for anthropology in a more abstract way. And, and for me as an anthropologist myself, but I had difficult to explain my story, to uh, give examples, to tell uh, the stories that help other people understand my skills, my take on the world uh, and my added value. So um, I kept stumbling forward. <laughs> um, and at one point I met uh, Masha and I met Lawrence, who are the co-authors of this book. Um, and we decided to write the book that we wished we would have had when we, when we graduated ourselves. So it's a book on the value of anthropologists, on the value of anthropology in a larger way, um, about uh, the skills, but not in the language of only anthropology, but also in the language of organizations and companies that uh, we work for or we work in or we work with. Um, and also about um, how, to, how to sell yourself, how to brand yourself, how to do your own marketing. So it's, it's about, how to sell anthropology to a wider audience um, to make the impact that you are looking for or, or just to, to, to land the job that you're looking for and um, to do the things uh, you want to do or you're able to do as an anthropologist. So that's why we wrote the book and we are kind of, we wrote it about uh, one and a half, two years ago, but it was translated and this translation uh, was published in uh, last May. And we are a little overwhelmed by the, by the, by the, by the, response around the world and, and, and the invitations for interviews and sessions like this and podcasts and everything and whatnot. And, and we love it because we think to spread the word of anthropology so as many people as possible should, should, should hear about it. And we want to, well, um, help tell better stories uh, so more people uh, understand what we do and how it helps organizations and companies. So um, that was kind of the introduction of who I am and why we wrote the book. Um, I was asked to, to, to give a talk, uh, an impulse that can be a little bit uh, challenging or maybe even confronting, I don't know, but I, uh, I prepared a couple of slides for you. It's like, uh, I'm looking at my screen right now, it's 12 slides. So I'll just go through them and then I'm th I would love to have the interaction with you and to hear your questions or challenges or tensions or, or kind of uh, that stuff. And, Laura will step in to take over from me after I'm done talking in uh, in 15 minutes. So um, I'll just start sharing my screen um, and I will uh, arrange uh, all the screens because I'm working with two screens here. Well, Laura already said it. I, I, I was asked for a title and I think anthropology rocks. I, I truly believe anthropology rocks. I think there's um, a lot to win in solving societal questions when you add anthropologists to the team trying to solve them and and not only societal challenges but also within companies and organizations which is my realm um but it's not the only realm you can apply anthropology for <laughs> it speaks for itself but i want to mention it but the thing is um and that's what laura mentioned as well i think if we confuse we lose and we are uh, great at nuance and uh, looking at things from different angles and i think there's great value to it so we shouldn't forget this but i think if we do this too much and if we don't play the game in the right way then we confuse a lot of people and i think we've been confusing many people many other disciplines many organizations for a long time and i think we're getting out of the getting out of the 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 the, the impasse but um there's still work to do so that's why i titled my my impulse talk like this if we confuse we lose and at the same time anthropology rocks so there's work to do um well, let's let's just start at the beginning. I think we need, as society, but also within organizations and companies, we're in need of new answers. And the reason is the old answers don't work anymore. 
if you look at uh, teams, I just sum up a couple of themes, but I'm, I'm working in the field of climate change and sustainability. But if you look at healthcare system, at least in Holland, and I think globally as well, at least in the States, if you look at uh, challenges uh, concerning migration, concerning mobility across borders, if you look at uh, our economic systems, if you look at the impact of technology and digitalization, I think, well, <laughs> technology, we've mentioned that already before today, but I think all those themes, all those topics are super large but our old answers don't work anymore and the thing is we have to find new answers um those new answers they are all about people they're all about behavior they're all about meaning they're all about culture and they're all about change and i think with those set of statements we are at the heart of anthropology that's what I believe, and, and, and I encourage you to disagree with me or to ha have your own opinion, because my opinion is just my opinion. So, but I think um, all those challenges, and there's more, of course, there's much more, but just, just a list to start somewhere. Um, they are about um, what society do we want to build? What organization do we want to be? Uh, what choices do we uh, hold dear? Um, what values do we hold dear? Uh, and how to achieve those things, how to create that impact, how to engage with those challenges and with those questions. And I think we're at the heart of our discipline, but we should claim that place. Because if we leave it to other disciplines, if we leave it to other people, they will they will step into the vacuum without asking, even perhaps without knowing that there is something like anthropology. And I think we have much to offer, a way of thinking, our perspectives, our ways of doing research, our ways of guiding change, our ways of telling stories. So um, I talked a lot about this, or we talked a lot, we wrote a lot about this uh, in our book. Um, so I won't go into that um, um, deeply today, but I think these are a couple of key ideas and 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 people shape culture and culture shapes people and this is what it is all about so we should claim our seats in this field of culture in this field of meaning in this field of sense making in this field of change but in order to do that we need to do a couple of things and and i think culture is a the most elegant um definition of culture i find i found so far is shared meaning and learned behavior so it's all about meaning and culture is a set of solidified beliefs as well so first of all it's it's a belief it's a conviction but then it starts solidifying itself into values and principles into behavioral norms into policy and processes and into the actual physical world into for example this hotel which is built mainly by wood and glass and only the foundations are concrete why because the owners and the builders of this uh, hotel believe concrete is not as sustainable as it can be or should be in terms of the challenges that we face as society. So this is how you see that convictions um, turn themselves into uh, the actual physical world. If you want to change, you can change this physical world. You can change your office environment. You can change all these things, but that doesn't mean the culture has changed. You have to move up again as well. So you have to move up into the world of policy and process, up into the world of behavioral norms, up into the world of values and principles, and up into the world of convictions and beliefs. And to do that, you can write new policies, of course, and they are helpful, but culture doesn't change with new paperwork. Culture doesn't change with more strategy. Culture change in interaction and decision-making processes, and there's leadership as well involved. So I think that's an important thing to understand as anthropologists and also an important field to move ourselves into if we're not there already. So um, there's two anthropologists in Holland who are doing some groundbreaking, well, of course there's more, um, but, but, but two of them wrote a book together uh, which is called the corporate tribe it's translated in english as well and they say well actually the two main drivers of culture are interaction and decision making because in interaction we contribute meaning we make sense of the world of how we experience the world around us so we do this in interaction and at one point we take decisions we allocate actions and we start doing things. But the decision-making process is an important driver as well because it's about who has the power, who decides what's normal, who decides what course of action to take, who decides who's included and excluded at the same time as well. So those two dynamics, the dynamic of interaction and decision-making process are super important drivers of culture. Um, that brings us to three points I want to make and together you could say they, they, they might be a manifesto. I didn't write them as such, but, but once I prepared this presentation, I thought, well, maybe they're interesting 
thoughts to share with you. Um, but if culture is built and shaped in interaction and decision-making process, this brings us to leadership. And I think this is a place that we should engage more with. So you can say this is like the, the stereotypical image and I get a lot of pushback from especially anthropology students if I show them. And at the same, you, there's a lot to, to be said about this, of course. Um, but still a reality that the white male uh, holds uh, a lot of leadership positions in this time. Um, and it's shifting at the same time. I think that's a good thing. But I, the, the point I want to make is power is a given. It's not a bad thing. And I think we anthropologists are quite good at searching down and searching sideways, but not at searching up. And I think power is a given. It's not dirty. It's not bad. It's a given. Um, and ranking is everywhere. So we all engage in this game of ranking, which is both formal, but also informal. And it's a given, power is a given. So I think this leads us to the question, or, well, to a set of questions, but are we ready to engage with those in power more? And I wrote a couple of questions here and, and statements as well. So I want to share this with you and I will share my presentation afterwards as well. Um, so, so you will have it. But I think, I believe we must engage with leaders more to help them become better leaders. I think we need to build rapport, have empathy, but also have compassion with the leaders and those in power. Um, that brings a couple of questions. Do we speak the language of power? Are we ready to search up? Do we feel comfortable in this field of power? And do we own our own ranks? as anthropologists, as specialists in the field of culture, as specialists in the field of sense and sense making and change, culture change as well. So I think we need to honor our rank. We need to dare to take a position to be bold and brave and also dare to be wrong, to be right more often. I really think so. And this is daring and this is about putting the ones behind you for a limited amount of time, but dare to be bold, dare to make this splash, to step out there and to make this position, to claim this position. This, this is what I believe. And you are totally free to disagree with that, of course. Um, but there's also something else that we um, need to address, I think. And this is about marketing. And, and until a couple of years ago, I thought marketing was like, well, flat marketing, I don't even know the right words in English, but, but like the cheap marketing and, 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 and building, uh, selling stories and, and especially bad products with hollow stories, basically. But I think we need to up our marketing game as anthropologists um, because this is about storytelling. And, and, and when I work in organizations and companies and I'm, when, when I open a newspaper or when I walk out of the door, I'm always looking for stories because stories are sense-making mechanisms. So stories are about sense. They're at the heart of anthropology again. So I think anthropologists are quite good at, 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 at seeing the story, at understanding the story, at, at um, uh, creating some kind of guidance around the story, but also perhaps at building or even sharing uh, stories, creating stories. So I think we need to up our game in this respect. And if we don't tell and sell and build great stories about anthropology itself and about what we can bring and about what we have to offer and how it helps build this better organization, stronger tribe, better better society. No one's gonna believe us but if, because if we don't tell it ourselves, no one is gonna do it for us. So we have to do it ourselves. I am convinced and I'm trying to do that myself with writing a book, with writing blogs, vlogs, whatnot, doing events and all that stuff and just running great projects. I like that myself, but um, it's up to my clients to judge, of course, but, but, but there's kind of a statement I want to make here as well and, and raise a couple of questions. Um, and, and I said some of it already before, but we think people shape stories, but in fact, stories shape people. So stories shape people in the sense that if we believe in them, if we step into them, we start behaving accordingly. So if we tell great stories about who we are, about what we are capable of and about how it helps achieving the results and the impact that you're striving for as an, as an organization or a client or, or a community center, this helps because people are sense-making organisms and, and, and the subline could be, and we're lazy as well. So let's help people, let's help everyone to make sense of anthropology, to understand what we do. And that's why we wrote this book. And that's why I tell a lot of these stories. And let's tell great stories about who we are, what we're capable of and, and what problems we solve and how we do that. If we don't do this, we confuse and we lose ourselves in the ones and the other is lost even before that. So if we don't tell this great story, 
we confuse. If we confuse, we lose. And I think this, this has been happening for the past uh, few years, uh, especially outside of academia. And I think there's a great movement right now. So don't get me wrong. And I don't want to... People are doing great, great, great work already for uh, four years, but I think we are in 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 a, in a wave right now, and we uh, we should use it um, because there's so much anthropology can do and has to offer. So if we confuse, we lose. That's what I think, and that's why I also really value the power of of marketing and branding. Might be even a better word um, uh, at large because it's not just it shouldn't be hollow, it shouldn't be flat, it should be real, it should be tangible it should be about people and i think we are in a position to build those stories to share those stories and to tell those stories um and that brings me perhaps to a third thing and i think we should take ourselves as a as a professional discipline a bit more serious outside of academia because inside academia it's it's a well-established field a well-established discipline uh, with a, with a, uh, a grand track record, but outside we're still looking even for a title. So are we organizational anthropologists or corporate anthropologists or, or, or applied anthropologists or design anthropologists? And, and of course we are everything. So, but we're, we're, I think we, we, we need to put a mark on the map um, to professionalize ourselves. And that means a lot of things. And I think you have images and ideas with it. And, and, and I think storytelling is one of them. Sense make, this shouldn't be here, but that doesn't matter. Um, there's this, this couple of thoughts I want to share with you on questions I want to raise. Um, but I think this is about professionalizing ourselves. It's about finding solutions for major challenges our societies face. And within those societies, my realm of working are organizations and companies, but there's other realms as well. But that means let, that we need to move beyond researching, beyond looking, beyond describing and engaging in making that impact and in bringing that change. And what we wrote in the book is that when I work for an organization and a client, he, he always says, well, thank you for your profound insight. It really is helpful. I'm not being sarcastic here. It's really helpful, but what should I do? Now what? And if we don't have answers ready to those questions, or if we don't have the proper questions to find those answers, then our clients are just getting lost and we, we, we lose our seat at those tables where we can make that impact. So I think that's what we need to do. Move beyond describing into engaging, into daring to make that statement, into daring to be wrong, to allowing ourselves to be wrong. And also say out loud and proudly that we are anthropologists and that we have a lot to bring and to offer. Always, no matter what. So I used to find this quite difficult or challenging, but when I give a keynote right now, when I address an audience, I always ask who, who of you has seen an anthropologist running out in the wild? <laughs> and people laugh and, and a lot of people don't have, ha have never seen an anthropologist running out wild. And that's the perfect opportunity to tell how I am an anthropologist and what I can do and how I understand my field and, and, and my work. So we have to, own it, to up our position, to own our rank. Um, and also be proud of those in our discipline who are trying to pave the way for others, even though sometimes it's clumsily, but people who are sticking out their neck, we are really good at being critical at, at, at everyone, especially those in power, but also at those who are trying to do the, something <laughs> and it's not right and you can approach it from a different angle as well and it's too bold or it's unnuanced or one but i think we should be proud of those who are trying to achieve something and and that doesn't um mean we shouldn't be critical but we should also be proud and we should give them well applause or or be happy that there's people sticking out their necks and trying to build that story and to spread that story um so i want to to, 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 to make a call to action, like let's be bold and brave and make that impact and engage in the outside world, outside of academia, with organizations, with municipalities, with companies, just get out there and tell great stories. That's, that's the point I want to make and the impulse I want to give. Um, and I see some nodding and I see some smiles and I see some thinking. So um, I'll just stop talking because this was my talk, this was my impulse. And of course I can talk about hours. Um, I can talk for hours about our wonderful discipline that we share, um, but I want to just to to well to leave it at that and to ask for reactions or questions or, or or reflections or anything. So I will just give the word to you and to Laura to 
facilitate this process. And I will just stop sharing my screen so we can see each other again if you don't have a second screen and, and everything. Um, but I will make sure to send the slides to you afterwards. So thank you for listening and staying on board this far. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Walter, for, for uh, uh, throwing so many uh, uh, things uh, at us to think about and to discuss. So um, normally what we do is, uh, and I think we, we still should do it because it's a, it's a very nice, uh, nice size of a group so that we could have a, a, a good discussion. Um, we go into breakout rooms and, and we discuss uh, the impulse that, um, that Walter gives us. So Walter, if, uh, if you had to, to summarize uh, the most, you know, if you had to issue a challenge to us that, that we discuss from your talk in, in, one, in one sentence, what would it be so that uh, I can uh, send people off in <laughs> so they can... Uh, I will just give you a couple of sentences and perhaps I will arrive at one uh, clear question, but um, I think it's about... Um, how to tell better how to build and how to tell better stories about ourselves and 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 what we can do and that's that's not really uh there's no tension in that question but i think another a little bit more tension tension tensionate question <laughs> question with tension in it is um are we ready and willing and capable enough to engage with those in power because it's very easy to be critical at, at them <laughs> we talk about them as well but we should engage with them, I think, more with leaders, because that's also the place where we can make this impact. So, so, so searching up is an important uh, theme, I think. So we can be very critical of those in power, but are we willing to engage with them? Are we willing to feel compassion with them? Are we willing to give them the benefit of the doubt? Um, and I think those questions, I, I don't have the answers to, but they, 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 they fill my mind uh, quite often. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Um, I, I think that uh, this is the challenge for today. Are we really willingly uh, ready to, and capable enough to engage with those in power? And how do we feel compassion with um, a, a group that we have traditionally critiqued? Uh, so what can we do uh, as anthropologists, colleagues, and employees um, to engage with people in power. All right. So in our group, we had the question, what can we do as anthropologists, colleagues, employees to engage with the people in power? And the fellow ADs came up to mind. Um, organizing events like you, for example, do, or for example, what um, Daniela Brown is doing with her congresses. Um, and within those, it is maybe a good idea to cite best practice examples to really showcase the added value of uh, our early, earlier successful projects with an anthropological perspective into the, yeah, the, the business world. And of course, part of that is actively taking part in networking, building your network, creating the gun factor to get into certain spaces. And uh, something that I now started doing is fusing languages. So as um, I'm sometimes talking to a business person, he or she will um, shut down when I start talking anthropology as a reflex. So fusing these business and anthropology languages in a way, but also um, cultural fusing strategically. So when you go to a meeting uh, where you know that their culture is more formal, you dress up also in a more formal way to suit their initial uh, needs and thoughts. Um, yeah, so that was our uh, thing of it. And I had a question with this as Walter, you, um, one of the questions you in your presentation said was, do we speak the language of power? Do we feel comfortable in the field of power? And I was wondering, which language do you speak when practicing the consultancy role? <laughs> uh, I think I, I, I speak some kind of, um, uh, well, my field of consultancy is quite wide because I work in the public sector and the private sector, and then there's the private sector, but in a financial institute, they speak a different language than in an engineering firm. So um, I try to, as an anthropologist, when I moved to Greenland, um, I tried to understand Greenlandic, which was quite hard. So I resorted to Danish, which I could read and write a little bit. Um, 
but when I moved to a different part, the actions were different. So if I uh, move around through the world of organizations and businesses, I try to understand the, the language, but the key words, the key stories, the key phrases, the key verbal outings, so mm -hmm. to say. Um, and I start using them in my own language as well in, when I'm in that field. And what I also do is put... put, put um, put in anthropology wherever I can. So of course you can speak with a board of directors, but you can also speak with the chief. Mm. <laughs> and if you start blending that languages, like you already said, uh, I think that helps. And, and it's like moving into this field. At first, you just don't know what language uh, uh, exists and what language they speak. So it's immersing yourself into that culture, into that language system to fully understand, or at least to understand um, uh, a nice amount of it. And then start using it, making it yourself, and blending in anthropology, and 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 then it's start to be um, well, perhaps a new language because there's no uh, duplicate organization. So every organization is different. Every 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 social environment is different. So the language that you speak needs to be adjusted to the place that you are, whether yeah. you're on Greenland or whether you're uh, within the ASM or multinational or the uh, municipality of uh, Amsterdam. And I guess you also adjust it to the, um, the how they prefer you are or how happy they are with you. Because I can imagine that sometimes you strategically wise um, talk like 70% in their context to make them feel comfortable. And then you yeah. can add 30% of anthropology. But in some case, you feel, hey, they're definitely liking what I'm saying. So I can add more anthropology into it. Yeah. Right? Is it like yeah. that? That's kind of... Well, the game doesn't really sound nice, but that's that's like the um, the the, um, the field that you're in. And if you if I start talking anthropology 100% from the beginning onwards, and it's like, wow, what, who who are you? And I don't understand you because you speak Greenlandic to me. But um, okay. if you if you feel like it's it's falling into fertile earth, you can add some more and add a new concept mm. and, and and try something else and. And, and use that weird image, but explain it properly. And then um, actually it's like showing other, showing your counterpart that there is another world and inviting him into it and, and yeah. perhaps seducing him, tempting him to step into that world of, of the world of anthropology, which I find it hard to define, but I think we all kind of understand what I try to say with that. Yeah. May I ask a follow-up question? Sure, but maybe there's other questions as well. So I leave it up to Laura to uh, kind of facilitate that process. Um, so how about, Namir, you keep that question um, just because um, I want to give give the chance for all the rooms to uh, summarize and we get back to you. And then I have a question about what, what that exchange that you two had as well. So, um, <laughs> all right, uh, who wants to who wants to share? Uh, what was the discussion and perhaps a challenge to uh, to Walter from uh, from another room? Just jump in. I can I please Simon. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, I was in a group together with Zendre, and we the crux of our conversation was basically being an anthropologist. Just being an anthropologist, simple and pure, and by the book. That also means being consciousness, being conscious of what you come from. And um, that it means know yourself, understand the story of the other, and know how to be reflexive between either, which is, you know, textbook anthropology. But for some reason, we have, of course, as anthropology have, you know, we've had more sympathy with, you know, the unsung, the downtrodden, and the subaltern. That has been more part of our pedigree, so to speak. And I come from a background from my studies that has been studying um, you know, processes of studying up. So say ethnographies of the IMFs, ethnographies of uh, Wall Street and stuff like that. We have all been extensively through it, but it was all still with a very um, critical lens towards it. So what basically happens is that, you know, this aspect of, of empathizing with, you know, the higher ups is being black box. And normally it's a very essential, one of the four that we identified. And uh, we should, you know, stop being so overwhelmed by their persona, you know, if you're trying to explain something to them, do it more from a systemic approach. That is, if you're trying to pitch a story to them and trying to invite them into the world of anthropology, just make a scheme of things that is very 
systemic, a comprehensive, but doesn't shoot for the stars, so to speak. So it doesn't really um, sprawl in, into space or anything like that. Just, you know, keep your language concise and simple. And uh, one of the examples that I think of why it's so difficult traditionally for an anthropologist to, um, you know, enter this, this world, it, it, it is basically about entering as well. And how do you access the world of, you know, those in power? And one example that I have is from, a, um, from an inaugural lecture that we had in 2018. That was when, uh, one of the, you know, uh, paradigmatic examples of like anthropology, Sherry Ortner, who has an impeccable record, came to speak for us about the Madoff case in, in the US. But instead of, you know, provide, you know um, talking about the case from ethnographic examples, she basically availed of um, secondhand information from journalists. And, you know, what is actually being, being kept from our track in anthropology after, you know, being conscious of our colonial heritage and being conscious of, you know, what used to be our mainstay, that is um, often people from far off places that have, you know, that were deemed to be stateless or non-mother, is that, you know, mostly our methods is being kept. But the method wasn't even mentioned. What was being kept is a discourse based on kinship, for instance. And then one of my professors actually raised his hand. He is, uh, was very, very candid for a moment. And he, he told her straight up, straight up, what is being anthropological about this lecture? So everyone was, you know, got into a fit of laughter and felt a little bit of embarrassment to that. But it was a very, I would say it was a very right question. And it was rightfully so that he posed that question because how do we get access to this higher echelon? How do we get access to the higher stratum as anthropologists? Because we are all, by, I don't know, is it by a dint of our reputation? Is it because we are not seeing the tradition? Maybe we should also be very conscious of the tradition that we come from before we are going into um, and that's the reason why we came to the thing of know yourself, you're an anthropologist, you know what to do, and understanding their story as well, because it's not always the case that, you know, these CEOs are, you know, this callous narcissist, it's, there is different stories, there is possibility that they really grew through the meritocratic ideal to that story, and in that sense, they have this aura of splendor that shouldn't scare you. All right, so I'm gonna thank Simon here for actually um, asking um, perhaps a bit more eloquently that I, I would have questions about access. So Walter, if you can share some tips about um, how do we gain access um, and you know at what cost um, in organizations, right? On a more practical level. I mean, know yourself as an anthropologist and trust the method is one thing. But also leadership, as you said, um, you know, um, address leadership because also um, organizations are quite hierarchical. So if, yeah. if leadership says okay to the anthropologist, perhaps everyone else says okay to the anthropologist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, or perhaps there's a pushback. But you know, the 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 if the equivalence is with the village, the chief is not always um, so easily accessible. No. So perhaps you can tell us a bit how. Um, you do that in your practice. Yeah, I have I have a couple of ideas about it, and 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 I want to start with with a counter question, like how and why do we get access to those without a voice, to those in uh, places with less power? And I think if we find the answer to that question, and if you, I want to challenge all of you and myself to find the answer to that question. Um, I think that might be key to how to achieve and access those in places of higher power. And I think the key is in, there's other disciplines who find it hard to access those without a voice, those without a power, those often overlooked. And we are wonderful at it. And I think one of the answers is because we feel for them, we feel empathy for them, we feel compassion for them. We try to make things better for for them and thus for society. So it's because of our moral compass, but also because of our empathy and our compassion. And I think we truly understand 
we try to truly understand their world and their challenges and their fears and their hopes and their dreams. And if, if I think if we do the same thing with people higher up in the chain, with people in, in places with power, if we truly try to understand them, if we truly try to understand the tough, tough decisions they have to make and, and, and the challenges they are up front, I think we have a different conversation with, with, with them. <laughs> and, and I think we talk about them, but that might even be the first thing to, to change because they <laughs> are just human beings like you and me. And there might be anthropologists sitting in those places. So let's just start and having the conversation with them. <laughs> Here I go, but you, you understand the point. And, and I think to, to, to translate that into a practical uh, matter, um, understanding their challenges is about understanding their challenges. So what drives them? What keeps them uh, awake at night? What tough decisions do they have to make? Um, so that asks for a conversation, for, for a true conversation. And I think in order to get at that table, you have to have your own story right. So how do you get invited at their table by having a new idea or an interesting perspective or a very clear and profound and deep insight or a way of working or charisma that helps? I don't know. And in my case, what also helps is um, when you are working with uh, culture and with sustainability, um, in the end, you always end up high in the chain because you are working with the soul of the organization, with the soul of the tribe, so to say. So you need to be at the table of those in charge. Um, so if my client is someone not high enough in the chain, I can't do the job I'm asked to do. So um, what I learned to do is to ask for a, a, quite a large mandate earlier in the process, even in the process of uh, sending in my proposal or my offer. Uh, and also um, doing that with a rate that's high enough to be taken seriously, not just by some guy, but by someone who thinks like, wow, is it, is it, is it that expensive? But that also means, is it that important? <laughs> so those two go hand in hand. And if they say, well, we want it, but it should be cheaply and everything. And then, well, well, I'm not coming. And of course I realize I, I, I come from a position of luxury right now, but I did not 10 years ago. Um, but I think this is an important thing to, to realize that we need to own our own rank in dressing, in our language, in our rate that we ask, in our proposal, in, um, in the conversations that we have, in the clarity that we give, in the insights that we give, and also in the courses of action that we provide, in the answers that we give, or in the challenging, precise questions that we ask. Some ideas. <laughs> I hope this answers your, 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 your very eloquent uh, question, uh, Simon. And perhaps it sparks even more questions. And I, I can imagine that too. And, and they're not like fixed in, 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 in Dutch, I would say in marmot and stone, but um, they're kind of my temporary answers that work properly now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe a second uh, thing to that, uh, Walter. And that has maybe to do with um, the part of reflexivity. And it's, it's also very difficult, I think, and, and perhaps very elusive if you enter a certain social context to be very conscious of your rank. So how, what are, the, what are for you the personal diagnostics, so to speak, that make you render, con that make you render clear or, make, or makes it very clear to you that you are at a certain position vis-a-vis -vis the organization? Yeah, like I said, r ranking is everywhere always. And I think as human beings, we are very um, sensible to your place in the hierarchy. So um, do you feel included? Do you feel welcome? Do you feel allowed to say something? Do you allow to feel questioned? So um, what I often do um, uh, is, is a, a literally kind of a body scan, feeling myself. Like you, you know you, you, this meeting you step into with a nut in your stomach, like <gasps> there's tension here. And, and you could be at the same place, same meeting one week later or earlier with nothing going on. So you, your body knows. <laughs> Your body knows what's going on. Your body knows kind of what what place in your uh, the position in in in, in the in the informal uh, hierarchy. So, um, and I think the challenge is to become more um, 
uh, comfortable in a wider set of social circumstances. So I've, I think a lot of anthropologists feel very comfortable in the field of the, of the, of the people without a voice, uh, the, the powerless. Um, but if we can extend the field that we feel comfortable to those, uh, to the boardrooms and to those places uh, where, where people are sitting with power, um, I think that would be the challenge and, and, and that helps also uh, to make an impact because that's the place where decisions are being made. So let's just sit at that table and try to guide it into a bit more inclusive or a bit more sustainable or a bit less extractive or, or uh, equal uh, direction. And then again, this is, I mean, what's right and what's wrong. And I think that's, that's about, that's a very normative discussion. And this is like, uh, what's your own personal moral compass. And that's another discussion and another event perhaps, but at one point you will get at that discussion. And that's the funny thing, put two anthropologists in one room and within an hour you will talk ethics and there's not many disciplines I know <laughs> who do the same thing. So I think it's both a great thing. And also like, sometimes we shouldn't. <laughs> Definitely a topic for another impulse. And Walter, now you're coming again <laughs> because this is a this is a, a, a fantastic observation. Janice, you have your your hand up. So I'm afraid I have to run, but I promise to uh, feed back to the group what we talked about in our in our breakout. So, and it leads on very nicely from what we've been talking about. And, one of the main focus points of our conversation, um, and it was Ebtisam and Satya Bhatta and I who were having this conversation, they're both students. So part of what we were discussing was how do you bring yourself to these encounters with, with people in power? And um, the fact that it takes, it takes some personal charisma, personal um, confidence to step into these rooms to engage in a meaningful way um, with people in power. But also, if we want to become leaders, um, you know, how do we do that in a way that we bring all our values with us? So not, not defining leadership in the context of those who already have power and are already in those leadership positions. So we were talking about um, a couple of different things there, but I thought Ebtisam's point about being an anthropologist in a world where anthropology isn't necessarily seen as, um, as, as a powerful profession was important to her as well. So defining herself as someone with impact and leadership potential in a space where, you know, the people who have power for her, parents and teachers and others, for example, may not see anthropology as being a powerful discipline, as being something, um, um, something of equal importance to some of your, your standard disciplines out in the world. So I think that was the crux of what we were talking about. I just wanted to, to put that out there um, to you guys, but Ebtisam and Satya Brata, please go ahead and you know add your points if, if you have other things to add. And I'm so sorry to dump and run, but I, I, do, have run. To, I do have to rush off. But, but it was great to talk to you all and, and really, really inspiring and as always. And I, maybe just one last comment, I think, you know, defining ourselves as anthropologists and, and people with power to engage with power is definitely helped along by discussions in these spaces. So thanks as always, guys. And I'm really sorry that I have to dash, but I'm sure I'll see you again soon. Thanks for sharing, uh, Jenny's. Of course. And and thanks, Valsa, for a great talk. You too. Thanks. Cheers. All right, Karen, so, jump in. If you want, maybe you can step in. Um, if there's some more. Um, Karen I... was raising her hand. Oh, so okay. Just, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't really sure what's uh, what's the right order right now, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to to uh, comment on what Janice just said because um, I really think that doing research on leadership or reflecting with people together on leadership is actually something that I think for organizational or corporate anthropologists um, is going to be really important. And I'm, I, I wouldn't say that I do corporate uh, research because I, I do research in social movements, but 
um, I see a lack of leadership or like people being uncomfortable with the concept who's kind of, yeah, making them less effective or, I don't know, endangering results. Um, so I think this is also something that I, I really connect with organizational anthropologists and it's something that this could have an impact and where the, the view anthropologists have on processes and people and narratives, as you said, um, I think it's going to be, yeah, important for the future, at least I hope so. Uh, so that was also one point in, our, in discussion in our group that leadership is not so much on the agenda, but um, it's everywhere. So oh, I think we have kind of a, this is also like, like Simon already uh, touched upon, I think it's partly due to our colonial heritage, but I, I think we have to, well, perhaps reinvent ourselves or, or overcome that, that kind of difficult relationship with power. Um, in the sense that we should still be critical, but in order to help people become better leaders, <laughs> we have to engage with them. It's very easy to, to be critical and to say what's wrong and why it's bad and, and, and how it doesn't work, but, but help them in order to improve is much harder, but yeah. I think that much more important. So um, I'm great that it, I'm grateful and happy that it resonates with you, Karen, and I see some nodding as well. So yeah. I think this is, and this is something I learned over the years myself, and I haven't found all the answers yet. But, yeah, I'm, um, I'm talking more about the collective leadership, actually. So um, like in social movements, it's like the research focus is going a little bit less on the genius individual, like yeah. saying um, things that have an impact or are important for the transformation to sustainability are more, more or less a collective effort. Yeah, and true. More often, we also look at people who just speak up a lot or on TV or whatever. Yeah. There's like a collective agency behind yeah. it, and it also has to be addressed and um, kind of reflected upon. Um, and so it's more a kind of a post-heroic leadership concept that yeah. um, I'm seeing as have right now, but it's still even more important to talk about it, like saying which kind of different forms can leadership take and why are we so uncomfortable with it? So um, Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. And I think um, it's easy to, to, to speak about leaders and about them, but I think that leadership can take many forms. And I think there might even be a leader in every one of us in this room, but 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 out there here as well. So um, that's also why I posed the question. Are, are we willing ourselves to take up that role of being a leader in whatever social context that you're in um, and, and make that tough decisions every now and then? Uh, that involves being a leader. It's not always easy, um, but I think, uh, well, maybe we we should embrace that role a bit more perhaps question mark i don't know <laughs> thank you thank you so uh, we're advancing on time uh, i just want to open the floor uh to whoever wants to make some final points or uh perhaps um, I didn't see a raised hand or cut off or, you know, my thoughts are many usually. So, um, um, you know, just, just feel free to, um, to jump in and uh, make some final questions or points or comments um, um, to Walter and, and to the group. And um, I will you have one... some, some few more words, but Amir, you just go first. Okay, well, I was still aching with my question. Uh, ha, let's see uh, if we can make it short. So you talked about in the presentation about uh, let's tell great stories about who we are, what we're capable of, uh, the problems we solve, because if we don't, we confuse. And so in, our, in my previous question, you said, well, because when I talk 100% anthropology, it's like talking, talking Icelandic, you said. Greenlandic, but yeah. Greenlandic, okay. Yeah. Um, but my question is, confuse what? Because if we don't, we confuse, you say, but what you mean with confuse? We confuse the other. We confuse our counterpart, the one we are trying to converse with. So if I was in Greenland and I was talking Dutch, the other one would like, good for you, but I don't understand you. So good luck with your life. So mm. if we don't um, speak the same language, but use the right examples, metaphors, images, stories, then we are... We can, sorry to say that, but then we can whine about nobody understands anthropology, but no wonder they don't because we don't speak 
we don't appall to their imagination. We don't uh, we don't speak their language. So I think that's where we uh, where where the job is ours to tell better stories, uh, find new language, find new. I don't know. Uh, that's what I try to say. So if and then we can sit in a corner and whine that we don't that we're not understood um, and that we're not able to make the impact that we want to. But hey, <laughs> the job is ours to find that place and to create that place and to learn that language i believe yeah there should be maybe like an anthropological marketing uh uh company or something perhaps uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure if we need that right because we have been talking so much about language but but when you look into leadership there is this very popular narrative around show don't tell right and i think what we can do as as leaders in the room to help leaders lead is Yep. basically show leadership how to engage with the people they are kind of um, leading in a way, right? Leading by example, we're exactly. Really, we're really good in, in engaging with them yeah. and we can help them to understand them, understand their needs, understand their agenda and thereby kind of grow them better together. And I think that's how we can show instead of just talk, right? The same language. And if I, if I can add to that, Marcus, I think this is a proper observation. And I think there is wonderful stuff going on throughout Europe, throughout the world of anthropology is doing really great things. But what we need to do is to, to put the spotlight on those things and to, 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 to distill the story and to tell those stories to the world. Because if we don't, then they don't know. And I think that's, um, that's the challenge and, and perhaps the assignment. And, and yeah. And that's bringing us back to, to a little talk that I also had or we had in our group on, with Karen also, who said that she wants to kind of summarize her uh, thesis and, and, and kind of write about how can you explain this and pitch this in front of leaders. I think that's exactly the point, right? We need those case studies, but we also need to translate that into a language that leadership understands exactly. and then be able to eloquently on point pitch it and convince how we can help, right? That's kind yeah. of a bottleneck that I still see out there. Yeah, yeah. Mette, you have your hand up, so feel free to uh, join. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, in these final seconds, a, a very uh, specific question then. So once you get uh, to the managers, uh, to their office, get inside there and have them talking, um, uh, like I have now in the organization that I'm in, um, I work closely with some of the managers and they want you, because you're an anthropologist, they want your input, they want your work, which is great. Um, but then you find yourself suggesting what you would, how you would approach the thing, like here's what we're going to do, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. You said that there were plenty of time, so let's try this, let's do that. Like you, 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 you give them the, the full shabam. Yeah, uh, because that's what they asked for. And then they yeah. go, nah, not really. And then it takes you six months to convince them yeah. what you should do. And then yeah. they end up uh, telling you to to do what they want to do is quick and dirty. And then you yeah. end up doing 15 phone interviews of five minutes, what I just did last week. Yeah. How how do you <laughs> what's going on? Um, yeah. What's how how do we like once we have the managers and the leaders talking and we have them engaged? They have the concept of anthropology. They think it's great. They think it's it's they we can do something different and it's quite yeah. exotic and it's quite yeah. relevant. Whatever yeah. it is we're doing. Yeah. But then but then they get back and then de they demand something from us because yeah. they can do that uh, yeah. since they're managers which is so non-anthropological or, or it could, it can be very anthropological to do 15 yeah. phone interviews, but that it's a different challenge. And how do we like, what, what, like, have you ever tried that? And what do you do in these I examples? Did. Yeah. Of no. course I made all the mistakes you, <laughs> you can Good. imagine. So <laughs> uh, I did those things too. And I think I've learned over the years to um, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you're in the middle of this process, sometimes it's super hard to, to turn the ship around. And then it's about, uh, sometimes there's no other choice than accepting the changed course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Frustratingly uh, taking those 15 interviews of five minutes and then, well, yeah, yeah. knowing that it's not, it's not what you advise them to do, that is not delivering the result and the impact that they want to, but okay, hey, this is, this is what it is. What yeah. I learned to do over the years is 
uh, aside from that this is a result and an outcome that happens sometimes unwillingly but it does you can also say no you can yeah. just refuse to do this yeah and the, and and then the question is um how hard do you want to play that game mm -hmm. and your no does it spark a conversation or does it spark your uh, firing as a consultant and they're finding another one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then the question is how bad how is it is it really that bad or is it okay and then there's like you have an interest because you're a consultant and and can you still uh, send your invoice maybe maybe not but this is like mm -hmm. i don't know and what i've learned over the years so you can say no that's a very professional thing to do and more often than not it leads to the question like huh we're not used to that why do you yeah. say no yeah and sometimes it, there needs to be some conflict and some tension before you get to that point of having the conversation that mm -hmm. you really need to have and then you can really make the point that you want to make that this is not anthropological and it doesn't need to be anthropological but if you want this value and if you want to have these insights you need to do these and these and these things mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and if you don't find someone else that's something yeah. i i sometimes say if yeah. you don't I find think, someone um, else because this is not what i believe in and and then there's a third and, and someone is starting to leave but what I try to do is upfront, before I go into this executing phase, deliver a proposal that gives me a lot of space to do the things that I believe in. And sometimes even send your invoice upfront if you feel like, wow, this is going to be challenging. That can be an answer too. Um, so it's creating the space that you need to have mm -hmm. to do the things you need to do in order to deliver the result that you're asked to. And, and my advice, in case you are not as advanced as Walter, um, is in his career and his professionalism. Um, I, I suggest, you know, just delivering quick wins is also is still very valid. I mean, at some yes. point, I think you sure. you have to also make sure that you stay in the game. Um, of course, and of course. Instead of instead of just providing the room for the most basic survey that everybody would do, um, you can also just say, well, let me try it this way, and you kind of try to prolongate the relationship and build trust with small okay. steps, right? Yes, of course, of course. I love that Person. question because it actually keeps coming up also in other in other sessions that we've had that are not specifically on the organizational and, and leadership issues. But um, a couple of times now, the question of can we as consultants actually fire our, um, our clients has come up. And I kind of love that question, A, because it's contrarian and anthropologists can be very contrarian, right? <laughs> But also B, I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very interesting also for me to consider because I have been in those situations where, um, you know, people want to have what ethnography does. They just uh, don't want the process of ethnography, right? They do want the five interviews for five minutes and that's it. <laughs> and so I, I really have to wonder how do we build in um, that resilience going in right and into our initial pitch the fact that this is not what we do um, and really this is why people are often tempted to ask midway but can you scale it can you do it faster but this is why it doesn't work so is it a question of onboarding your client and building that that capacity to say no in so that also you don't find yourself in this tricky situation midway um, where you have to be forced to give up your professional um, yeah. uh, also, you know, and sometimes I wonder even in an even more contrarian vein, do you actually invoice, because Walter said invoice in the beginning, do you invoice a surcharge to your client for making you do something against your professional, you know, uh, you know, asking you something like, okay, uh, but we want to do it this way, but you've hired me as a specialist, as a professional, right? So I'm going to give you my professional opinion, but if you decide to go against it, um, because it also impacts how this project looks back on, you know, on, on my professional portfolio, right? And how I look, there's going to be a surcharge. I don't know. I've never tried it. I'm not advocating for that. But in a, in a more contrarian, as I said, and sometimes occasionally pissed off vein about why is it that people want ethnography but don't want the, the process of ethnography? And how do we translate that? I'm sorry, guys, I know it's getting uh, 
longer and longer, but thank you for staying. And I really had to had to build on that because I think it's it's important and Walter is here, so <laughs> I stop there. I think this is wonderful questions and I'm happy to engage with that. So my, my summer holiday starts tomorrow. So uh, you're my last public appearance. <laughs> And 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 um, my heart lies in anthropology, so I'm uh, I'm happy to 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 linger on for a little while. But um, I think those are great questions, and um, I think um, uh, uh, easy answers. Can you fire a client? Of course you can. I mean, they can fire you. You can fire them. If you don't feel this is this is you you can do the things that you want that you think are necessary to do, or you can't do them in the way that you think helps achieve those results. Uh, of course you can fire them but i think like before you end your relationship or your marriage there's a couple of points <laughs> and and most of the time you should have a sit down and have a proper conversation and in order to i mean of course there's a power balance between you and your client and more more often than not the client thinks well i'm paying I, i'm the customer so i get to decide how we approach this and i think this is partly what i try to to um to explain with also my talk, it's like we need to own our rank and we also need to own our professionalism and, and setting boundaries and, and setting conditions uh, under which we are willing and capable to do the job we are asked to. Um, so I think we can say no and we should more cleverly think in an earlier phase about what we need to, to be successful in in a specific project or working with a specific client. So sometimes I had an interesting conversation this morning as well with um, uh, a client who turned into a friend. Um, and I said like, sometimes I facilitate dialogue with very, uh, with a lot of tension or, or, or potential conflict or just outright conflict exploding, even in an online context, which is adding something to how hard it is. But for people to really feel that I am um, um, compassionate to them as well, I shouldn't be the one hired by the manager and addressing only his or her interests. I should become the people's guy. I should become everyone's guy. Who uh, so I, I I should be able to be a, to to relate to everyone. So what I sometimes do, I don't do it often. It, it happened a couple of times, two three times. I send up the invoice upfront and tell in that session that I did this thing to be fully independent of what, what, what happens and to be independent of management as well, to be able to have the conversation that is necessary. So there, there is ways to, to um, I think in this case, being independent was super important to deliver the result that I was asked to. Well, it wasn't going to be an easy session. I knew I informed my client. I said, this is really, I, I informed him twice, <laughs> a couple of times. Um, and I said, this is what needs to be done. And are you still on board? So I really asked him upfront <laughs> if he was ready to go through this. And that also mean I was going to send my invoice upfront and that he was supposed to pay it upfront before the session actually took place. So I demanded the trust from him. <laughs> To have that session and if he would have said no that would have been a proper answer as well but i couldn't have done the thing he asked me to so um can you say no can you say can you fire a client i think but what we um i think it's an interesting thought that you that you raised like should we surcharge <laughs> if we uh if we are uh, pushed into a direction we don't believe in i think you could of course but i think you you turn your project into a financial yes and no discussion. And that's not the place where you want to be. You want to have the dialogue on uh, how it helps or doesn't help delivering the results that he wants or she wants. Um, yeah. But super interesting to hear that there are definitely some different mechanisms that you might still have to practice and get insights on what really works and what works best, right? And I, I love to hear also surcharging thoughts. I mean, that's yeah. a little new to me, but love that. Or idea. just, Simon. Or just, or just, I think questions of how do we onboard, right? Um, how do we yeah. build in that, uh, that ability to, to push back, I think is important, but uh, important. 
yeah, I, I, I will repeat the call to action that Marcus just posted in, uh, in, in the chat. That those are precisely the kinds of organ, uh, organizational anthropology questions uh, we want to continue in, in the Apply Club organizations that just kicked off. So um, feel free to um, uh, leave your information and to join the club um, in the link. Uh, that Marcus posted. And, and Simon, very briefly, perhaps you, you close off the session uh, with the last, last question. Your hand is raised, so. Ah, yeah, yeah, but I already posted it in the chat box. And what I basically wanted to, um, to get back to is maybe if we're talking about, you know, what the client wants and for what kind of means the client thinks it, it can be achieved. There's actually a good ethnographic argument that I found in uh, my previous study of cultural anthropology and development studies. That is the difference between success and, you know, that you have to tell apart success and the production of success. Yeah. Basically what happens is that, you know, people sort of tailor their policy um, by the exigencies and demands of many different organisms, most often the stakeholders, people that actually invest in a certain project and able to see certain results. But whether that those results are actually, you know, producing certain diagnostics that are actually indicating success, that is a different um, story because you're transforming data, you're transforming the, the raw things that you find on the field. And that was in the context of eight projects. So development projects, I think uh, David Moss was talking about his project in, in South India, but I don't remember exactly, but it's, um, it's a thing that you have to think about. What kind of, you know, measurements do you apply? And how do you think that certain KPIs, because that's what most, I think, uh, companies are still working with, are actually conducing of actual success. And do you, can you be self-conscious about these KPIs? Can you maybe change them or look for alternatives that can, that, you know, are more appropriate to measure the success of ethnography? So that will, you know, require more spatial temporal um, thought or more spatial temporal sensitivities given the fact that ethnography is a long-term endeavor. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, just going to stop here because I think I've already, because I think most people just want to leave, but I think the, the basic um, the punchline, the bottom line is how do you tell the difference and how do you see um, the production of success and what are the factors contribute, contributing to success? And is there an, and are there just alternatives? And I think you raised the right question, or maybe not the right question, but a couple of great questions, because um, I think we, if we shift away from um, uh, the conversation about the results into a conversation about the process to achieve those and being responsible for that process and still being dependent on a lot of other factors um, and people, including leaders, <laughs> to achieve that process, uh, to achieve that result and success. Um, and then the next question is how to measure that with, with what KPI? And I think what we also should should um, try is to, uh, um, uh, how to measure culture in a, in, in a quantitative way. I find it really hard. I still haven't found the answer. So I think if we move into the discussion on, on, on KPIs, which I think uh, could be a very interesting one, we should find ways to define those things in a very qualitative way. Um, because that's also reclaiming the approach and the perspective and the ways of working uh, of anthropology instead of still moving into the field of hard and tangible uh, things. So one thing I once did was, um, and don't just stop talking and, and, and the afternoon continues for, for everyone, but um, was um, measure the number of conversations on culture and the number of people who engage with that. So that was kind of quantitative, even though it didn't really say anything about the quality of the conversation. And and uh, and even though there, there could have been 30 people talking about culture for one hour, it, did, it, it could have less impact or less quality than the conversation of five minutes between two people somewhere in the organization. So, but, but saying, this number of conversations about culture over this period of time with this number of people involved 
was some quantitative measure and that convinced people high up in the chain to say, okay, let's let's move on with this because it it this is something that we kind of believe in. So yeah. I'll Thanks, Walter. Right now Thanks, well. Simon. Yep. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> this was an amazing impulse and a very, very fruitful discussion. Um, this was Anthropology Rocks, and I think we all know that Anthropology Rocks, but if we confuse, we lose, and to avoid that we confuse too much, we are very proud that Walter is going to stay with us as one of the mentors of the Applied Club for Organizational Re um, Anthropology. And um, Yes, we will definitely continue the discussion. We will keep you posted on all the activities from the Black Lab Organizational Anthropology. And with that, um, let's leave Walter transition into a lovely vacation, <laughs> hopefully. And thanks again so much, Walter. And Thank you, guys. Time. Thank you for, for listening in and for spreading anthropology. I, I love talking about it and you as well. So uh, let's share that love for anthropology. You'll be back. Fantastic. I know. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, cheers. Thank Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching or listening, and don't miss the next episode of EASA's Applied Anthropology Network's Apply Club events.